Well, vindication is the word. We've seen one of the heads of the 9-11 Commission, Senator Graham, come out and said that he's seen the 28 pages and that it shows that Saudi Arabia was quarterbacking much of the 9-11 attacks where 15 of the 19 hijackers reportedly came from. Uh, and we've had uh, five of the other members, so that's six of the 10, come out and say the same thing. I've had Congressman Walter Jones on recently who's seen the 28 pages, and it doesn't just show that Saudi Arabia was involved, but there was a ordered stand down through the entire system. And now we have the New York Post who would attack 9-11 truthers with the headline yesterday, how the FBI is whitewashing the Saudi connection to 9-11 and then goes back to it. See, they always frame 9-11 truth as that you're saying like Wiley e. Coyote, they actually said this. Uh, this is a talking point they used that the Bushes used, but then Chris Matthews of Hardball used that I quote, Alex Jones quote, believes, this is a quote, a talking point. It's been in newspapers. That like Wiley Coyote, George W. Bush had a detonator plunger and blew up the World Trade Centers. No, I never said that. I said criminal elements working at the international level had drills that day, ordered to stand down, and then you extrapolate out to the uh, Al-Qaeda being allowed into the country, the CIA threatening the visa section to let them in, saying they really work for us. Uh, Colonel Stephen Butler at the Defense Language School saying some of these guys trained at my base. You add all that together, we know we're being lied to. So we're simply saying the official story isn't true, and that's been proven. And because we don't know exactly what happened, then you can debate all day like a whodunit, like Clue. That's how you figure out in an investigation what really happened. And I'll ask Michael Springman, J. Michael Springman, uh, his view. He has a new book out that I just started reading, uh, reading and I, I even learned something from it, and I've studied this in depth. Visas for Al-Qaeda, CIA handouts that rock the world, an insider's view. And the book is now available. He's a former U.S. diplomat, exposes the leadership and policies that spawned a deadly international conflict and killed over a million Iraqis. Springman holds degrees from American University, Georgetown University, and Catholic University of America. He currently practices law in Washington, D.C. Again, Springman serves the U.S. State Department government as diplomat, State Department's foreign service with postings in Germany, India, Saudi Arabia, and also worked at the U.S. Commerce Department. He uh, left federal services and currently practices law in the Washington, D.C. area. MichaelSpringman.com. Michael Springman, two N's, at the end, dot com. We'll tweet out his book and website right now, please. At Real Alex Jones, please retweet that. Talk about courage. He blew it wide open in a few uh, Canadian, British, and U.S. papers and German papers, but it was shut down everywhere else. We got him on the air going back 14 years ago. The 15th anniversary is coming up, and he was one of the key people to expose what happened. And tie that in today with Judicial Watch, who covered what he said back then, FBI holds special meeting in Juarez to address ISIS, DHS not invited. Here's another headline. General warns the head of Southcom of ISIS fighters entering the U.S. through Caribbean. He says they get into the Caribbean, then get in through Mexico. That's Newsweek. So understand, what happened on 9-11 is replaying again. And good FBI tried to expose the people training not to land the planes or take off. In Minneapolis and in Phoenix and in Dallas and got made to stand down. So this is going on. The government's not our enemy. Criminal elements within it that are exploiting this to launch wars and take our liberties are, in my view. Now, I'm done with that preface. Uh, Mr. Springman, great to have you back after many years. I think you were on about six years ago and then 14 years ago. But God bless you for your incredible courage and for continuing to stand up and uh, writing this book. I know you're a successful lawyer in your own right. Don't need to, you know, write a book, but I'm glad you've written this testament as a witness to what you saw. Thank you so much, sir. Well, thank you for having me on the program. I'm delighted uh, to be able to speak to your audience and to do my best to answer any questions you might have. Well, let's do this. Let's let you quarterback it at first. Take us back to 9-11, walk us through the book, and then give us your take on what you think is currently happening. Because, boy, isn't it pertinent today how our government funded uh, the Free Syrian Army that was really al-Qaeda, now they're ISIS, uh, and now we, we were told al-Qaeda and Muslim extremists were defeated. Now it's a bigger threat than ever three wars later. Yeah, it's basically changing their brand names. Uh, when I was in Jeddah, and oh, that's more than 20 years ago now, 
uh, I was being pressured to issue visas to people that had no ties to either Saudi Arabia or to their own country. They couldn't explain why they were going to America. And uh, I was being ordered by Jay Frayers, uh, the consul general, who some suspect are working for the Central Intelligence Agency, and other people with the consulate, to issue these visas. Um, never gave me an explanation why. If they had, uh, conceivably, I would have been dumb enough to um, uh, issue the visas that they wanted uh, on the basis of, well, I work for the federal government, you work for the federal government, this is a federal government uh, interest, uh, I'll do it. But no, nah, they couldn't do that. So after I was out of the Foreign Service and back in D.C., uh, we had September 11th. And uh, Joe Trenger, the journalist, who tipped me off to what they were really doing, recruiting the Mujahideen to fight the Soviets in Afghanistan, to go to the federal government, to go to the Department of Justice and the FBI and say, this is what was really going on. This is where you guys ought to look. And I was passed from office to office to office. And finally, the Washington field office for the FBI said, oh, we'll call you back. Well, that was 14 years ago. Since then, I've been speaking out on this. I've been writing about this. And aside from the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, RAI, uh, RT, um, and uh, a, a German journalist, uh, I've been ignored by the American press, the mainstream media, the fawning corporate media, as Ray McGovern calls it. Well, they certainly are fawning. And if you just joined us, visas for Al-Qaeda, CIA handouts that rock the world, J. Michael Springman, let's... Let's go back and look at this, because do you feel vindicated now before we walk through it that you do have the head of the 9-11 Commission coming out saying they basically covered up, stood down for Saudi Arabia? I mean, that's, that, that, that's complicity right there. And it's now even in the New York Post that demonized anyone, including firefighters and police, uh, that questioned 9-11? Well, it makes me feel a bit better, but then you've got to look at the fact that uh, they've kept a lid on this for 20 years or more now, uh, they've ruined people's lives, they've mocked them in print, uh, and, and so forth. So uh, it's better, but uh, the wheels still haven't, still haven't come off the wagon, and nobody's in jail, and nobody's been executed. Well, I want to give you the floor right now. As best you can tell, mm -hmm. break down exactly what happened with the hijackers, what your colleagues tried to do, what you reported on and exposed, and then mm -hmm. all these years later, what do you think really happened on 9-11? Okay. Well, going back to me in Jeddah, uh, I had gotten this strange conversation with the then-American ambassador, Walter Cutler, who was in town for consultations with State Department officials. And uh, one of the people from the, the Saudi desk, the people who follow what's going on in a given country, uh, called me and said, Cutler's in town. Do you want to say hello to him? And I said, yeah, sure. I figured it'd be a five-minute hello and goodbye session. And he spends 45 minutes talking to me about all the problems that my predecessor, Greta Holtz, had created for the embassy in Riyadh. She was refusing visas, so he said, to the servants of rich Saudi women, their seamstresses, hairdressers, and all these other factotums, and they just couldn't travel without them. And I thought, he's telling me something, but I have absolutely no idea what he's telling me. So when this was over, I talked to the desk officer, and I said, what was that all about? He said, I have no idea. Cutler is just a queer duck. Well, I get off the Jetta, get all this. I'm welcome with Oakham Norms. Uh, people tell me, uh, you're such an improvement over Greta Holtz. She was such a bitch. She was a troublemaker. Nobody could get along with her, and so forth. Well, after a bit, I started getting pressure on issuing visas that, to people who weren't qualified. Uh, one guy, or actually two Pakistanis, I think, were going to a trade show. And they couldn't name the trade show in the United States and couldn't tell me what city it was located in. But Paul Arvid Tveit, T-V-E-I-T, a case officer, according to um, namebase.org, uh, who was working undercover at the commercial section, called me and demanded visas for these guys. And I said, no, they haven't proved that they have any compelling reason to come back either to Saudi Arabia or their own country. So then he calls Justice, given name Stevens, the head of the consular section, and got these guys their visas. And this pretty much went on for the 18 months or so that I was in Jeddah. Nobody could explain this. Um, and the odd thing was, Eric Qualkenbush, the um, 
Q-U-A-L-K-E-N-B-U-S-H, the head of the CIA base at the consulate, uh, he came to me and said, Mike, we've got this Iranian agent. We want him in Washington for consultations. Uh, we really need to have him there. Uh, can you issue him a visa? Wink, wink. Well, the guy had a clean passport. He had previous visas to go to the United States in it. He was working at, or running, in fact, the family had a um, uh, oriental rug shop in the town. And he was going to visit clients. He had their names there on a sheet of paper on company letterhead. He talked about what he was going to do there. He answered all my questions. And I issued him a visa. And I said, good God, send me more people like him. And I still to this day don't know why Qualcomm Bush tipped me the wink about this guy, but said not a word about all these other people who uh, were really sleazy characters that the agency was sending uh, to the U.S. for training to send on to Afghanistan to the war against the Soviets. So that's why you say this went on 20 years, because this was happening even before 9-11. Now, fast forward from yeah. my memory, you end up yeah. leaving, but then you've talked to colleagues and find out they were told the same thing with Mohammed Atta and others. Walk us through that. Okay, well, um, once I was out, I heard from Joe Trento, the journalist uh, who follows national security issues, that the real reason they wanted visas for these guys was to send them to Afghanistan. Uh, they were creating the Mujahideen. And I said, that's why they got so mad when I refused the visas. And I started researching. I started writing letters. I sent letters to uh, everybody involved, including Joseph P. O'Neill, the so-called inspector who came out and, and really wanted me to tell him what was going on in Jeddah. And he said, I'll protect you. And he didn't. He, he passed the word to the State Department and the CIA, uh, of whom I think he uh, was a member, uh, to get rid of me. And I had nothing but trouble after that. Once I was out of state and after I talked to Trento, uh, I had written an article about this published in Covert Action Quarterly, uh, The Hand That Rules the Visa Machine Rocks the World. Uh, this got me a few interviews. And um, I tried after that to learn exactly why I had been thrown out of state. I filed a Freedom of Information Act request and a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit around, oh, maybe... Uh, 1991, 1992, thereabouts, and got nowhere. Uh, as time went by, I sent letters to everybody else I had been involved with, Freyers and Henry Encher and Karen Sasahara, his successor as political officer, saying what was really going on in Jeddah. You know, time has gone by, you can tell me. Dead silence. So then I filed a Freedom of Information Act request and ultimately another lawsuit, uh, I guess about three years ago now, uh, asking what I should have asked for the first time around. All of the visas that had been overruled by Frayers and Justice Stevens. And when I was in JETA, the filing cabinets were bulging with old visa applications that nobody had shredded. They were 5, 10, 15 years old. And my staff said to me, look, Mike, if we shred these things like we're supposed to do every year, we're never going to deal with the 100 to 200 visa applicants a day we're getting. And we got a choice. You want us to shred documents or you want us to uh, work on these visa applications? So I said, do the visas. And uh, the lawsuit again was dismissed by um, Reggie Walton, uh, a Bush appointee, a guy who was put onto the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act court, the secret court, and he first demanded the names of all 45,000 visa applicants a year I was dealing with. And I said, that's impossible. And the uh, state said, well, we shred these documents every year. And I said, that's impossible, and gave them an affidavit about uh, the bulging, overflowing file cabinets. And he simply dismissed the case. And I said, well, I want to know who dismissed who or who shredded these documents. Uh, what was their names? What was their rank? When it was done, don't you people keep records? Uh, there's a guy in the British government, uh, Nick Pope, who had written about uh, freedom of information and national security. And he had mentioned that, well, you know, in a big organization, papers go missing, files get misplaced, and so forth. But if you're dealing with government, if you're dealing with national security issues, if you're dealing with uh, major uh, topics like visa applications, 
these don't go missing. And if they do, there's a very questionable reason for why, and we need to investigate something like this. Well, that prompted me to start writing the book. And in the course of doing the research, I found out that basically, as I began to suspect, the people who were sent to Afghanistan uh, also were sent to Yugoslavia. I found through John Schindler's book, um, Unholy Terror, uh, that these were some of the guys that had been trained in Afghanistan and fought in Bosnia and were involved with the planning or the execution of September 11th. Now, let's stop right there. This is so huge. The KLA out of Albania involved taking over areas from Serbia. Serbia fights back. <laughs> They're called terrorists on the news. NATO bombs them. I'm not saying the Serbs are perfect. The point is, is that, again, using them as a secret army and then meanwhile using the drug money from what I've read, to launch the next operation. That's exactly right. Uh, they, uh, the guys uh, got NATO intelligence. The guys got NATO training. Um, the guys got uh, money to uh, and drugs to sell back and forth to finance their operations, just like they did with Iran-Contra. Uh, in Michelle Chasadovsky's website, there are a number of articles, Global Research Canada, that talk about using drug money to fund the war in Yugoslavia and to destroy the country. I, I want to go back to 9-11, and again, we just joined us, Visas for Al-Qaeda, the former head of the uh, Jeddah, Saudi Arabian, U.S. Embassy Visa section, who saw them letting terrorists fly around before, then after, talked to people involved, and, and he's going to get to that in a moment, and basically said, hey, you know, let these people in, they're not really terrorists, they work for us. I want him to get back to that in a moment, but to know that they are using Al-Qaeda-type groups as secret armies uh, against the Serbs, against our basic liberties using that threat to take our freedoms uh, against uh, Syria, Libya, Iraq, I mean, all over the world, this is getting so obvious. What do you make now of the reports by Southcom that ISIS is coming into the Caribbean and Mexico and into the U.S.? Is that just hype to get more government funding, or are they covering their butt? I don't know for sure. I The first I heard of it, actually, was uh, when you mentioned this on your show uh, just a few minutes ago. Um, I'm inclined to think this is more like uh, George Bush and uh, these other people saying, well, if you, we don't stop Iran uh, and, and Ronald Reagan, if we don't stop uh, uh, the Contras in, uh, in, in Nicaragua, they, we're going to have to stop them in, in Harlingen, Texas. Uh, I would suspect that this is basically hype and beating the drums for more security, more uh, removal of personal liberty, and to pump more money uh, into uh, these organizations in the Middle East sure. to destroy the rest of the, the region. Uh, there's still uh, a few people left there who are fighting back. They're doing it in Yemen. Uh, Bashar al-Assad, he may not be the world's best president, but... Uh, he didn't start the war, and he's certainly better than al-Qaeda, and, and I won't be able to speak to that. I agreed until about six months ago with your view that it's just more hype to get more FBI funding and more Homeland Security funding. The issue is, though, I see them allowing ISIS to recruit, uh, you know, 18 to 25-year-olds all over the world, from the U.S., Canada, Europe, England, to Australia, to fly there to fight. It is a proxy army, and I see it being promoted domestically as kind of trendy. And then I ask, are they going to allow ISIS to attack to even take more liberties? Uh... It's just getting really, really suspicious. Yeah, it's conceivable. I mean, uh, when they were recruiting for Afghanistan, there were 52 recruiting offices in the United States for the Mujahideen. They were rounding up Arab Americans uh, to either fund the operation or to be recruited and trained to go and fight in Afghanistan. I, I was thunderstruck at that. I hadn't heard about that at all. But it was in Peter Bergen's book, The Osama Bin Laden I Know. That's right, and that's now admitted. And, of course, Reagan didn't – I don't want to blame Reagan. He didn't know at the time either. But, obviously, he had all those meetings, the White House with the Taliban leaders, and, I mean, ridiculous film footage. But, it, it you know, that happened. Yeah. Wow. Uh, I want to get into the book in the next segment. I skipped a break. we got a few minutes left here. Give us the meat uh, for new audiences that just tuned in of – because it's so groundbreaking what you were able to discover and talking to your colleagues that were still in the State Department about – how many of the hijackers were actually given visas uh, to come into the United States, even though they were on a terrorist list? And what story was given to to force the uh, the embassy to do that? 
Well, uh, as I discovered in researching the book, um, well, 15 of the 19 hijackers, according to the Los Angeles Times years ago, got their visas from JETA. And I thought I had raised enough hell with my Freedom of Information Act lawsuits and letters and speaking out that they would stop this stuff. Um, but I learned in doing the research that uh, this Shana Steinger, S-T-E-I-N-G-E-R, she was hired for my position uh, in JETA to issue visas straight out of Columbia University uh, at FSO for a very high rank with someone for someone with no experience, no training, and um, just the student background. She did this. She issued the visas, gave equivocal answers to the uh, 9/11 Commission, and has since uh, gotten promotions and is still working for the State Department. Wow, and. We know Muhammad Atta then and others uh, were able to go to some other training camps in other part of the world and come back through Saudi Arabia and then into the U.S. Uh, that's what I, I've seen. You know, they, these guys uh, moved all around. They got visas from the U.S. And if you get a visa from an American consulate or an embassy and you go to another country, uh, they're very quick to issue you a visa because, look, the Americans had investigated them. They have better resources than we do. Um, in addition, they went and they came back. And... Uh, it, it, it uh, removes bars to their travel. Amazing. Stay time. there because this ties okay. into everything we see happening now. The book, Visas for Al Qaeda, J. Michael Springman. I'm Alex Jones. Stay with us. In the third hour, we're going to have open phones and hit the economic news, the TSA news, the Russia news, the Mexico news. Uh, more on our investigation down on the Texas Mexico border with Joe Biggs and others. I'm going to play some of the congressional hearings where they're like, we've got to ban bloggers. They're like ISIS. And that ties into this new uh, memo put out to the armed services. We were leaked it through the Coast Guard. It's got phone numbers and emails, folks. It's confirmed saying they're preparing for veterans to attack on April 19th and that we're the biggest terrorists. So talk about using 9-11 to set up a police state and then focus it on domestic uh, legal constitutional organizations. It's It's... Pretty amazing to see this transformation. We're going to get Mr. Springman's take on that, the NSA, and so much more. Uh, you know, as a lawyer and, and as a former diplomat, what he thinks of the transformation of FOIA requests. People say, I don't care about FOIA. Well, most FOIA requests now go unanswered, even though it's federal law. The government operates in secret to, quote, keep us safe, but then won't release any information. That is a recipe for total enslavement. We're going to talk about it in a moment. Pieces for Al-Qaeda. CIA handouts that rock the world, and that ties into this story in the New York Post just a few days ago, how the FBI is whitewashing the Saudi connection to 9-11, what we told you 14 years ago, what he told you 14 years ago, and he joins us now. Again, the book is something everybody should get. You should support people that are telling the truth. You should give this to skeptics and friends and family and others or donate it to the library. That's how you win an information war Let's speak some about the book. You've agreed to take phone calls. I'll give the number out for specific 9-11 questions or visa questions or four-year questions. This is a very important issue. 800-259-9231. 800-259-9231 with specific questions or brief comments for our guests. But I want to finish up talking about the book. You're a smart guy. I want to get your take on the NSA, on the way America's changed, on where the world's going in general. And how do we turn this around? So, Mr. Springman, tell us more about the book itself. Well, the book starts out <clears throat> essentially talking about my experience in the State Department and uh, the problems I had getting in and the problems I had once I was in. Uh, we've mentioned this a little bit earlier about my issues with JETA. Um, I went on from JETA to Stuttgart in Germany, where I had been there some years before, um, and it turned out that the two, uh, two of the three consuls general that were there uh, worked for the Central Intelligence Agency. In fact, I was told by the uh, legal advisor's office at the State Department not to link day mount, it's D-A-Y, like the, the day of the, the week, uh, mount, and Doug Jones to any of the American intelligence services. Uh, these were guys that uh, blocked me from what I was doing. Um, created difficulties for me in the office. Um, and it was just absolutely amazing. They refused to do anything at all about uh, 
following what was going on in Germany with the younger generation. They, they clung to the old guard, the people who uh, were in their 70s and 80s and above who uh, had lived through the war and the end of the war and uh, just loved America and, and couldn't uh, or wouldn't see uh, any good in talking to anybody else who might have had a different opinion about the United States, who might have had a different opinion to where Germany was going. But uh, it was a um, it was a rocky ride there for uh, two years as well. So uh, I went on from there and then pointed out some of the problems these people created and uh, how they violated the law and regulation. So uh, bottom line, they were letting uh, Al Qaeda, Saudi Arabia, and secret armies have U.S. visas that basically get them in any country in the world, so they could carry out their nasty operations, narcotics trafficking, murder, terrorist attacks, you name it. Oh, not in Stuttgart, but in, in, in Jeddah, this is what they were doing. Absolutely. Yeah. Can, uh, I want to continue with a book that walks through how all this works in fine detail. It's so important. But go back, because you got cut off on the break. Talk about yeah. the KLA, because that's come out since you talked about it, that, that so much of the 9-11 funding came out of there, Albania, all of that, the Clintons. I mean, this is bipartisan. This is, this is how oh. they fund this stuff. Yeah, it, it was run very much like they ran Iran-Contra. They were slipping money in secret to people. They were giving training in secret to people. Uh, they had um, intelligence given them. Uh, Clinton didn't have a, a clue about foreign affairs, and he went along with these people. Uh, they wanted to do to Yugoslavia what they had done to Afghanistan and create a, a cadre of uh, uh, essentially terrorists, a wrecking crew, if you will, that went from that would go from country to country. And by God, they've done it. It's, they've started in Afghanistan. They went to Yugoslavia. Uh, they had um, drug money running the place. They had. Uh, they even worked with the Iranians uh, to fly plane loads of weapons and supplies in. Uh, the German uh, 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 delegate to the, uh, uh, the peace talks and to the uh, mediation conferences they had, he was a fellow from their external intelligence service, the Bundesnachrichtendienst. So it was a, a, a really nasty operation all the way through. And it wasn't quite as well concealed as they've done in, since then. They were still learning, I guess. Uh, they took one guy... Um, a Norwegian helicopter pilot, a Captain um, Ivan Moldestad, to a uh, hotel balcony and threatened to throw him off because uh, he was asking questions about unmarked aircraft with fighter escorts flying into airfields in Yugoslavia. And he wanted to know where they were coming from, and he contacted the NATO uh, Aviation Center in Vicenza, Italy. And uh, nobody wanted to talk about this. Man, so, I mean, it just sounds like a giant mafia worldwide is using radical jihadis to destabilize countries, and sometimes they overthrow the country and put them in charge, or they remove them, and then they come in and make massive you know, amounts of money off of the response. Uh, it just sounds like something Spectre would do out of a James Bond movie. Yeah, it's, it's, it's almost too fantastic to believe. You've got uh, uh, Yugoslavia broken up into small, ineffective statelets, uh, they've been trying for years to break Iraq into three pieces. They haven't quite succeeded, but the uh, the Kurdish North, through the Israeli influence and uh, American efforts, is almost a separate country. Uh, and they're trying to split the um, the Shia South from the Sunni center as well. They haven't quite done it, but they've in fact wrecked everything in the country where you have electricity for only a few hours a day. Um, nobody has any education anymore. It was one of the uh, the shining lights of the Middle East with uh, a great literacy rate. Uh, women were uh, had equal rights with men. Uh, people were educated. The language of instruction for doctors, medical doctors, was English. Uh, and Yugoslavia is a, oh, no, Yugoslavia. I'm sorry. Iraq is a failed state. Uh, they moved the people into Libya and murdered Gaddafi. Uh, Libya, under Gaddafi's rule, while he may not have been a, a wonderful uh, uh, philosopher, king, leader, but uh, under his rule, uh, Libya had one of the highest standards of living in all of Africa. They murdered him, shot the country up, destroyed the country, and you read in the paper every day that there's a new terrorist attack, there is a new uh, government, and there is a uh, attempt to secede from one part of the, the place or the other. And then they've moved all the bad guys into uh, Syria, and they've done pretty much the same thing there. Uh, 
Syria is essentially a, a non-state now. Uh, it, Damascus, uh, the oldest continuously inhabited city in the world, uh, is about the only thing that Bashar al-Assad really controls. And they've destroyed most of the uh, 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 United Nations World Heritage Sites, uh, and nobody seems to care. Uh, they just seem to think that, well, we need to get rid of Bashar al-Assad, and then Syria will be so much better. But they ignore the, the fact that Bashar al-Assad has kept together a patchwork of religions and cultures and philosophies together. And uh, while Syria might not have been a, uh, a country with a fantastic standard of living and uh, so forth... Sure, the, I mean, uh, compared to al-Qaeda, Assad <laughs> is a philosopher king. Yeah. And, and expanding yeah. on that, Hillary said, I made a mistake in Libya, and they have these headlines saying... Libya now a failed state. Hell on earth. Thousands being killed a month. Uh, black Africans being targeted by jihadis. And they act like they screwed up. The plan was to destabilize it because mm -hmm. Libya was uplifting all of Africa. It was creating an investment fund that actually was helping. So, I mean, you could say Gaddafi was a bad guy a long time ago, but he actually was starting to live more frugally and was giving almost all the money to the people, I'm not endorsing socialism, but he was actually doing it, and it was actually working in the public works he was putting in, and the money he was giving to other countries, and now all of Africa is, is, is as you know, they admit, descending into hell, and al-Qaeda forces are spreading all over the continent. I mean, and, and, and then uh, AFRICOM says, oh, now we can come in to deal with the threat. Yeah. I was talking about that on RT a couple of weeks ago with a guy from um, Cairo University who was an expert on Africa. And uh, he and I agreed that this Boko Haram business is just another version of Al-Qaeda. It's another rebranding of the, uh, the franchise of uh, lunatics and crazies that allegedly espouse Islam. And uh, it was a, we thought, both of us, that this is another way to destabilize that part of Africa because it was spreading beyond the original infection point to other countries uh, nearby. Simply amazing. The new book, Visas for Al-Qaeda. Where's the best place for people to find it? Amazon.com? They can get it from Amazon.com. It's uh, in uh, Amazon in the U.S. and Amazon in Britain, France, and Germany as well. People need to read this book and see the facts for themselves, especially now that all this is coming out. Say, see, we told you so. And they can also get it as an ebook as well. Well, that's fantastic. Let's go ahead and talk to Jeff in Georgia. Jeff, thanks for holding her on the air. Uh, thanks, Alex. Um, great to talk to you today. Uh, great conversation, great guest. It would be great to have uh, McAfee, him, Siebel Edmonds, Tosh Pumley all sitting at the same table and get some stories from that. Um, Specifically, I was called to ask his reaction when he saw this whole uh, underwear bomber thing go down and the exposure by uh, Kurt Haskell. can't recall his name exactly, but uh, the exposure of that and how the man was let on the plane and, again, signed off by CIA and allowed on board. Well, basically, from what I understand, uh, this underwear bomber, somehow uh, he didn't really have the proper paperwork to get on the airplane. He didn't have a visa, I think. That's right. And he was shepherded through uh, uh, a security... A uh, sharp-dressed, uh, well-spoken American man basically argued and ordered them to let him in. So knowing your background, who has enough power to order people to do that? The United States government, uh, TSA, uh, the CIA, the State Department. Uh, we don't know. The uh, It was an Israeli company that was uh, running the security at the airport. And uh, it, it was, you know, so strange that, you know, somebody puts underwear, uh, uh, fills his underwear with, with explosives and tries to set them off on the airplane. Uh, that's more along the lines of the, uh, the, the, uh, the shoe bomber where the guy tried to set fire to his shoe in the cabin. That all it does is create an opportunity for creating fear on creating uh, tighter uh, alleged security. Security theater, I think, is a better word for it. I think basically it's it's um, it's absolute nonsense. And then that makes everyone a suspect when it's the shoes, it's the belt, it's the yeah, shampoo. I mean, yeah. Or, or breast milk for women who are lactating. No, well, that's who you got to watch. Can't trust anybody but the government and the big corporations that run it. Jeff, does that yeah. answer your question? Uh, yeah, and then just to tie in that, well, we do know what the, uh, you know, uh, who benefited from that, and that was uh, Chertoff. 
as soon as he leaves the government, he goes to work for the company that had the body scanners all lined up and ready to go. No, that's right. That's what I understand. Simply amazing. Caller, we're going to jump. Thank you. Jerry, Gordon, Max, Stephen, and others. Your phone calls are coming up. I'm Alex Jones. We're talking to J. Michael Springman, an insider view, visas for al-Qaeda, CIA handouts that rock the world. It looks like they're building up again for major events. Holder's gun ban targets veterans. I'm going to detail that article coming up. Military bulletin labels Patriot Group's militia. Domestic terrorists says they're about to attack on April 19th. That's what all these military drills are about. And then it's the right wing supporting the whole police state takeover. And meanwhile, they're being prepared to attack them. It's just hilarious if it wasn't so sick. Also, they're saying it's sexist if you don't want a overweight girlfriend. And that it's a conspiracy of the male patriarchy that we don't want that in the news. Paul Watson breaks it down. Uh, I don't know. I don't really, I'm not into really skinny women. Uh, I'm going to be honest. I like voluptuous. I mean, I think everybody has different tastes. Some people are into 400 pound women. I mean, that's, 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 this is how this works. You can be in what, you can like what you want. I'm going to like what I like. I mean, in Turkey, I hear they like big men, or at least they used to. That's fine. You can have them. Uh, it's just that we're allowed to have our own views and our own taste, but that's coming up in the next hour. I want to do this segment in five more minutes with our guests. We can stay with us so we have enough time to take some of these calls. Uh, we have Mr. Springman, um, Visas for Al-Qaeda author with us. Jerry in West Virginia, you're on the air. Yes, hi, Alex and uh, Mr. Springman. I just really am curious about the 28 pages that were unclassified and have yet to be released. I also lived in Saudi Arabia, and no one is aware of all the Americans and UKs that are locked up in the Saudi jails, that Aramco, Arabian American Oil Company, whom I worked for, uh, doesn't do anything to help these uh, American and Brits and other people that are there. And the stories can go on of the horrendous treatment of foreigners and expats living in Saudi Arabia. But that's politically correct. I mean, they're allowed to because it's the right thing to do. Just like Mexico can torture our people and that's okay. Um, do you have a question for Mr. Springman? Yes, I want to know where the 28 pages are. That's a great question. What do you make of all that and the people that have seen it and what they say, Mr. Springman? Well, I mean, the thing of it is that uh, the United States tends to overclassify a lot of things, but also at the same time, uh, they will not let anything out that will make the government look bad, that will make a politician look bad, that will make a decision look bad. So I, I think the 28 pages are A, either nothing, or B, uh, it's a bombshell, and it shows the ties of the Saudis and maybe the Israelis and the American government officials to September 11th. And the only way to learn about it is to declassify the 28 pages. Well, I've talked to Congressman Jones and others, and they say they've seen it. It's it's beyond that. It, it's, it's stand down. It's that people were ordered to basically shut up and let it happen because they didn't want to, quote, embarrass Saudi Arabia. Yeah, well, if, if that's the case, and I can see them holding the lid on and doing their damnedest to uh, keep the truth from getting out. What happens if it does come out that Saudi Arabia ran the attacks and that our own government stood down? That makes them complicit, doesn't it? Oh, yes, indeed. And the, so the United States is working with the Saudis to destabilize all the countries in the Middle East, most notably now uh, in Yemen. It's the Saudis with American advice and assistance and intelligence from uh, NSA spies in the sky uh, to go and kill civilians in, in Yemen because they're the wrong brand of Islam and because the Saudis want complete control of the Arabian Peninsula. That's right. It's about Saudi Arabia setting up a globalist empire, and they're the muscle. Unbelievable. Jerry, great question. Thank you. One more call before we go to break. Uh, Max in Wisconsin, you're on the year. Greetings, Alex. Uh, when Smitty was talking with you the other day, supporting the Hillary Corpocracy, he said uh, that under Clinton, we had eight years of peace and whatever. Well, yeah, let's talk about that when we come back. If, if, if Mr. Springman can do five more minutes. Can you do five more, sir? Sure. All right, we're going to go to break 70 seconds, come back and talk about that. I mean, look, both parties are a bunch of warmongers. I mean, one thing, we're fighting a war to defend somebody. We're fighting wars to destabilize. We'll be back. Stay with us. I'm not a diplomat like our guest, Michael Springman, but I have studied history because I find it fascinating. And up until about 1963 or so, the U.S. generally did try to build up countries 
and and if they did an overthrow, they tried to put in a better government and actually tried to build up the industry of the country to then make them an ally and a successful partner. It was still corrupt, picking winners and losers, violating the doctrine of George Washington, even the Monroe Doctrine. But since then, it's degenerated until they're not even trying to overthrow countries to get somebody bad out. They want to degenerate Serbia, degenerate Syria, degenerate all these countries. They want to wreck them and then leave them wrecked. And that's not even good for business globally. So that's my view on it. Mr. Springman, what do you think's behind this? Then we'll talk to Stephen and others. Well, I think uh, your point is is pretty much on the mark. The uh, They don't want a, a viable functioning democracy or something close to a democracy with a healthy economy making life better and better for the inhabitants. Uh, they want to destabilize and destroy the countries because it gives them more effective control. Uh, they can move uh, the CIA in. They can promise them the sun, moon, and stars with a rebuild of their economy using American contractors and American equipment and so forth. Uh, but basically, I, I think it's uh, uh, the rebuilding is more of a uh, way of shifting money from one pocket to another pocket. That uh, in Iraq, for example, they have all these horrible tales of corruption and uh, money going missing, but uh, nobody goes to jail for it. Nobody gets investigated. Uh, it's basically a... Uh, a big scam. Wreck the country. Uh, give us control of uh, uh, the various factions we've created to fight one another, and uh, we'll promise you that you will have a much better country next year. Except that doesn't happen. But uh, in the meantime, money uh, is exchanged. Banks get rich. It's a high tech uh, way to conquer countries. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's like the Roman Empire: divide and rule. Wow. Uh, I agree with that. It's just a fact. Uh, Stephen in Michigan, you're on the air with our guest. Go ahead. Hey, Alex. Thanks for having me on. Uh, my question for your guest is, how can the mainstream media completely ignore all the evidence that 9-11 was an inside job? That's a good well, question. The yeah, the mainstream media uh, is run, in the United States at least, by maybe four or five large corporations. Uh, they don't want to offend advertisers. Uh, they're very close to the government, as Bob Perry noted in some of his books about uh, how he was tossed out of the Associated Press. Uh, they want feel-good stories. They don't want to antagonize anybody that has any power. And they want to keep their uh, good relations with the, the federal government. And they've allowed and corruption to totally take over now. Exactly. Good question, Steve. Thank you. Bob in Colorado, I think the last caller we have time for, then I'll go to Aaron after you leave us. Go ahead, Bob. Do uh, you have any questions for Mr. Springman? Yes, sir. Um, the recently released ISIS video promises another 9-11. Now, we know 9-11 was an inside job, so I don't know what to make of that. I was just curious what your take is. I mean, if I can get mine briefly, it's another inside job. If you let these groups build up, get armed, they're crazy jihadis, but you let them in. It's like putting a bunch of black widows in your neighbor's bed. You didn't make the black widows bite them. You just let them in to do it. Or a bucket of rattlesnakes, so Mr. Springman. Well, basically, uh, they like to keep the fear alive. And as Cheryl Bernard had said, she was a Rand analyst who was married to Zameh Khalilzad, who had been American ambassador to Afghanistan, to Iraq, and to the United Nations. She said we went out and we knew we couldn't beat the Soviets in any possible way, so we decided to collect and arm and train the most outrageous zealots, the most crazy fanatics we could find and we turned them loose, and they killed everybody. They killed the moderates, they killed the progressives, uh, they killed everybody who didn't agree with them. And you end up with this cadre of vicious extremists that have been turned into what I call the, the Arab-Afghan legion that fights anywhere and everywhere the United States sees enemies. Amazing, Mr. Springman, Godspeed, thank you for your courage. We're gonna be right back, stay with us. <laughs> <laughs> 